Hi, everybody. This is A.J. Heitman, Editor-in-Chief at GEMS, and welcome to today's webcast, uh, Evidence and Controversies in Pre-Hospital Fluid Resuscitation. It's uh, highly interactive. There's lots of opportunity for you to type in questions. Ryan, we got your first question about the awful music that plays. We don't have control over that, or we'd have some Led Zeppelin or something in there for you, but hang with us because we're live and uh, interactive right now. It's session is presented by Dr. Mark Peel and is sponsored by 410 Medical. Um, the optimal approach for and the importance of fluid management and shock has been heavily discussed and debated in the last 10 to 20 years, and the concept of early aggressive fluids has really shown benefits in multiple studies since 2001 and worked its way into currently something that's near and dear to my heart is uh, sepsis protocols for hospital and EMS groups. And in today's important and highly informative webcast, Dr. Peel is going to review the current literature and studies and provide a summary of current understanding of the optimal approach and situations for rapid fluid and um, resuscitation in uh, shock patients. So just a few housekeeping notes for you as we get started. It's both live and interactive, as I said, so you can ask questions at any time by clicking on the Ask the Question button in the presentation window. We'll answer those questions during the Q&A portion at the end. And GEMS Managing Editor uh, Ryan Kelly and I will be triaging questions and in some cases combining them. So uh, don't get upset if we've combined your question, but we're trying to maximize time. And if you're running a pop-up blocking software, you'll need to disable it to view the webcast. In addition, it's recommended that you close all other applications for better performance. For your convenience, uh, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of this live event. A reminder message will be sent to all of you with a link to the archive, and you can share it with others, and it'll also be archived on gems.com webcast, and we have a lot of people that really benefit from that. I also want to thank our sponsor, 410 Medical, for supporting today's webcast, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Mark Peel is a pediatric intensivist at Wake Med Health and Hospitals in Raleigh, North Carolina. He's also an advisor to Wake Med's Mobile Critical Care Services, so he understands our functions in the field. He is a co-founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical, but his real discussion today is going to be on fluid resuscitation uh, with, as we've asked him to do, sharing uh, uh, his device that he has developed, uh, which is one of our hot products from EMS Today this year, which is amazing. Of added importance, Dr. Peel is a member of the GEMS editorial board and a trusted advisor to our team on areas such as pediatric care, pediatric resuscitation, and fluid resuscitation. Uh, GEMS, I will say, is successful in helping you be successful in the field because of individuals like Dr. Peel. So at that, I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Peel. Have a great session. Thanks, AJ. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, just want to give a quick uh Quick disclaimer, I, I intend this talk to, to largely be educational. Of course, my product we've developed in my company is about food resuscitation, and I want to introduce uh, the concept of our product for sure, but my, my main goal here is that we're going to talk about the, the difficult topic of food resuscitation, um, which is a source of um, struggle and controversy, whether you're in the pre-hospital environment or in the hospital, and there's just a lot of a lot to cover. And so we're going to discuss why we need to give fluids, uh, some of the evidence for and against, and, and some practical tips on how to, how to manage your patients in the field. Um, just a quick question. You guys are seeing my slide advance, correct, AJ? Uh-huh. Okay, great. So let's start out here with what we know about fluid resuscitation. We know, as, Jay, as AJ mentioned, that fluid delivery saves lives in shock, and particularly in septic shock. Um, and other types of shocks, such as this patient you see in one of our helicopters being um, taken from the scene of a, of a car accident. Um, but we have trouble resuscitating effectively because we have trouble with the IV access often. The methods we use of giving fluids are often difficult, uh, slow, complex. And particularly in the pre-hospital world, manpower is limited. We don't have enough hands to actually get the job done that we need to get done. And therefore, fluids uh, are often delivered too slowly, or unfortunately, often not at all, to the patients that need them. Um, for septic shock in particular, uh, we know that there are many national and actually international guidelines on how we deliver, uh, how we care for this condition and how we deliver fluids. And they all rep 
uh, emphasize rapid diagnosis, aggressive treatment of sepsis, all guidelines recommend fluids as a key component of care, and yet there's less guidance in the guidelines on how fast to give fluids or how much to give or actually how to do it. And what we also know is that the guidelines are rarely achieved um, either pre-hospital or in the hospital. Um, um, uh, so what I want to do first is just run through a couple cases where you may that you may encounter in the field and where you may uh, need to give fluids. So just to give us a representative sample of cases where uh, fluid resuscitation may be important. So case number, and these are all real cases from, from our experience um, in Raleigh. Um, case number one, 50-year-old male, uh, multiple drug ingestion, including alcohol, benzodiazepines, antidepressants, uh, narcotics, EMS is called to the home on arrival, he had agonal respirations, no airway protective reflexes, was uh, cyanotic, bag valve mask ventilation was initiated, his initial uh, heart rate was high, his blood pressure was in the 80s to start and quickly dropped to the 70s. So keep these cases in mind as I go and we'll refer back to them later. I'd love to talk about them in detail, but this is more just to present a few cases you might actually encounter. Uh, number two, a 68 year old female, uh, been having cough and fever for a couple of days. Her family called EMS when she became somewhat less responsive at home one morning. Uh, she was found to be febrile, tachycardic at 130, breathing fast, and have a systolic pressure in the 70s. Uh, the medics put on an entitled CO2 monitor and found it to be 20, quickly placed an IV, and as noted in the, in the EMS record, ran normal saline wide open. Um, and over the, the EMS, uh, run to the hospital, they, she experienced no improvement in her heart rate or blood pressure. Um, number three, uh, potentially a scary one, a six-month-old, had a viral illness for a couple days, um, had a fever the day before, had not been eating well, and the mom found him gray and mottled and unresponsive in his crib. Called EMS. Uh, when the team got there, they found him mottled with a weak cry, really prolonged cap refill of four seconds or greater, super tachycardic and with a blood pressure of 68 over 30. And lastly, uh, a 14-year-old adolescent who had reported having a bug bite on the arm that you see pictured. Um, her uh, urgent care prescribed Augmentin, um, seemed to be getting worse over the next day. Then she developed vomiting and fever, a rash all over her body that looked like a sunburn. Um, she became difficult to arouse and confused. Uh, 911 was called and the team found her to be febrile 104, tachycardic, and to have a blood pressure of 83 over 50, over 35. So, you know this already, but all of these patient, patients have some form of shock. And what we're going to discuss first is what is shock? Because it's often a confusing term to define. Why does it matter to us, and how can we all uh, get better at treating it, both in the pre-hospital setting and in the hospital? Um, you probably would have guessed already that all of these patients need some type of fluid resuscitation. But how do we know how much, how fast to give it, actually how to administer it, how to know if that patient's responding, and how to know, most importantly, if we're not, that we're not causing harm with too much fluids, which is, uh, I know, a concern everyone has. Um, so, uh, shock, let's define it. We're going to do a little physiology here, and then we'll move on to, to some data and evidence and recommendations. But shock is basically an imbalance between the amount of oxygen that is delivered to the body and the amount the body needs. So demand is outpacing supply, and it usually results from the cardiac output or the amount of fluid and blood the heart is ejecting being inadequate, inadequate to, to deliver the needed oxygen to the tissues. So why does this matter? Because when you have inadequate or cardiac output and shock, you begin to have tissue death. The organs, the cells within the organs begin to die when they are not perfused well not, and oxygen is not delivered. And so shock's an emergency that needs immediate treatment. And we know from lots of evidence, as AJ mentioned before, that every hour that we delay reversal shock doubles the risk of death in kids. That's well documented in kids. And that in adults, even one episode of hypotension, of low blood pressure under 90, um, increases the risk of death threefold. So hypotension in the, in the adult patients you encounter is not minor. And it's one of the most important markers of shock that we'll be looking at. 
So what causes it? A little more physiology here. There's basically three big categories that you've heard of over and over, hypovolemic, distributive, and cardiogenic. I'm going to quickly go through those just to help us uh, understand what we're treating and why. Um, so hypovolemic, basically the tank is not full enough. The blood vessels containing our blood have lost blood or fluid either through dehydration, not taking enough fluid in, uh, heat illness, uh, severe di diarrhea, or we've lost blood from hemorrhage internally or externally from, from trauma or uh, gastrointestinal bleed, for example. Um, distributive shock is the tank, the, the blood vessels are getting too big, so the tank's not necessarily not full, but it's gotten bigger, so the effective circulating blood volume suddenly drops. That's because our blood vessels, as you can see on the right-hand picture, uh, contain muscles that regulate their diameter. And if they all relax at one time, the, uh, the, the space to fill becomes greater and the effective circulating blood volume drops. And this is common in sepsis, uh, in anaphylaxis, and in neurogenic um, uh, vasodilation from spinal cord injury. And then lastly, <clears throat> cardiogenic. And I just want to clarify that people also will describe a form of shock, call, shock called obstructive, which is really a subset of cardiogenic shock. And so cardiogenic shock is basically the pump not working. The heart is not working for some reason. That can be from chronic heart failure with an acute exacerbation. It can be from an acute MI. It can be from myocarditis, which may be caused by an infection or a toxin, or an obstruction like tamponade after trauma with some other, for, for some other reason, the blood, uh, blood of fluid is collecting around the heart or from a pulmonary embolism. Um, interestingly, a pneumothorax is also a form of, of cardiogenic shock or obstructive shock. Now, septic shock is fascinating because it's actually a, uh, an overlap of all three forms. So the germs or the bacteria that are floating around in, in the bloodstream release toxins, which, first of all, dilate the blood vessels, causing distributive shock. Um, cause leaky capillaries, which means fluid leaks out of the blood vessels into the tissues and effectively makes the patient hypovolemic. And that's people with sepsis are often, have often not been drinking because they feel ill anyway, so they have other reasons to be hypovolemic. And then cardiogenic, there's a di direct cardiodepressant activity of some of the toxins that sepsis produces. So you may have all three forms in septic shock, which makes it hard to treat. So how do we recognize shock? shock? And basically, we're looking for markers of not enough blood and oxygen getting to the tissues. Number one, therefore, is altered mental status. So if someone's not getting enough blood to the brain, they're not going to be awake or they may be confused. Number two, tachycardia and tachypnea, big ones, because the body's ramping up its efforts to deliver oxygen better by improving heart rate and then in the, with tachypnea by um, blowing off CO2. Hey, um, AJ, just quickly, I'm hearing, I'm seeing a bunch of questions that say, where's the sound? So I, I hope you guys are able to hear me okay. Yeah, if anybody's having sound, just uh, type that in and we'll, we'll rectify that for you. Okay. I, I know you guys are doing that in the background. I just wanted to alert you. Sure. Um, decreased end tidal CO2. So why is that? Why do people get decreased end tidal CO2? Well, inadequate perfusion to the tissues results in acidosis, lactic acidosis, the the, blood, the cells are not getting enough oxygen. They convert to anaerobic metabolism and build up lactate. That leads to acidosis, and the body compensates for that by trying to breathe off CO2. So your end tidal is low. It's an incredible marker of illness and um, a really important pre-hospital tool. Now, with the lactate, I know not a lot of folks are doing pre-hospital lactates, mainly because of the expense, but it's a great, also a great marker of uh, inadequate perfusion, particularly over four. Hypotension, the big one. So um, this, is, this is something that should alert you to a problem immediately. If a patient has a systolic blood pressure under 90 or a MAP under 65. Remember the easy calculation in kids is that a blood pressure under, under 70 plus twice their age is a great marker of when their blood pressure is too low. So babies 60, 1 to 10 year olds, 70 plus 2 times age, and everyone over 10 should have a systolic of at least 90. It's an awesome, easy rule of thumb to remember. And remember, you can have shock without hypotension, particularly in kids. Blood pressure is the last thing to go. This happens in adults too, but particularly beware of hypotension in kids because they are well down the path to um, potential cardiovascular collapse if you see hypotension. And then lastly, skin perfusion. It's a great marker. How You, you press your 
your finger into the, the palm of the sole and watch for a capillary refill. And if it's, un, if it's over two to three seconds, there's a problem with perfusion. All right, so how do we treat it? We basically want to restore what's lost or repair what's broken. So in hypovolemic shock, we're trying to get volume back into the body, and that's either going to be fluid or blood. And in most uh, pre-hospital folks are, are, care, are not carrying blood products, so it's going to be uh, fluid. Distributive shock, we want to both increase the intravascular volume, which has effectively been lowered, and we want to improve vascular tone with pressures like norepinephrine. And then cardiogenic shock, we want to remove the obstruction, so decompress the pneumothorax, for example, or dissolve the PE, and improve heart function, one way of which can be to give uh, very careful boluses of fluid, and two can be uh, agents like dobutamine, dopamine, or epinephrine. So, what are some actual conditions where we might need to give fluids? And we've mentioned some of these in the cases, but in, in the hypovolemic category, think severe dehydration, uh, healness, heat stroke, and trauma, of course. Distributive sepsis, anaphylaxis, and drug overdoses, uh, one of which I mentioned in the, in the cases. And then cardiogenic shock. MI, particularly right side MI, maybe volume responsive. Myocarditis, super caution with uh, fluid administration there, and we'll discuss that. And then tamponade and pneumothorax. And remember, I'm not going to go through them all. I know eyes are probably rolling when you see the H's and T's. But in PEA arrest, at least five of the H's and T's need volume, need a rapid volume administration. And so um, in cardiac arrest with PEA, it's worth thinking about, is this patient going to respond to volume? And should I be trying it? OK, last bit of physiology. We're going to talk about the Starling curve, which I hate thinking about, but it's really important to us because it basically teaches us the relationship between the amount of blood going into the right ventricle, or preload, and the amount of blood that ventral can eject, or stroke volume. And stroke volume is really what we're trying to improve when we give fluids. We're trying to improve cardiac output. And on this curve, you see towards the left, when you give a bolus of fluid, you actually improve stroke volume. Way towards the right, there's a point at which you have diminishing returns, and you can actually cause harm by giving too much fluids on the flat portion of the curve. So most patients we're encountering who are critically ill are on that leftward side of the curve and will be volume responsive. Um, next slide shows how heart, changes in heart function change this, the starling curve. If a child is tachycardic, febrile, and their heart's running at 200 beats a minute, they may actually have increased cardiac function with outpouring of catecholamines and may better respond to fluids. A decreased heart function, as in heart failure, still may be on the early leftward end of the starling curve and respond to judicious smaller boluses of fluid and improve the cardiac output. Okay, so let's, let's transition now into what do EMS guidelines teach us about responding to shock. And I've chosen to start with the North Carolina EMS protocols for hypotension and shock, which neatly divides uh, shock into the four categories of hypovolemic, cardiogenic, distributive, and obstructive, which is actually a, a subset of cardiogenic. And note in the purple box, the first purple box, every one of them calls for 500 mils of normal saline repeat to effect until systolic is above 90. Simple, straightforward, reverse the shock, get the blood pressure up. With one exception, which is in a non-right-sided MI, you need to be even more cautious, and they recommend a 250 mil bolus, if you see down the second column down at the bottom. Um, I've chosen another Wake, uh, uh, North Carolina County uh, EMS protocol on septic shock, and you can see in the right-hand yellow box, again, 500 mils of saline bolus, uh, until systolic is over 90. And if it's not, after two liters, then the recommendation is to begin norepinephrine. And lastly, I have a, a protocol from Texas and one from Florida, um, one being a little more cautious with the fluid, administering 250 mil boluses until systolic is above 90. So that would be you know, quite a few boluses, uh, eight boluses or so, and then starting pressors. And then on the right-hand side, simply recommends two liters rapid infusion for hypotension then progressing to <coughs> pressors. So I'd like to um, offer my first question to the audience. And it looks like we have several hundred people on the line. And um, um, I'd love to know if you were confronted with these or if these are similar to your protocols in a septic shock patient, how often do you feel in the field realistically that you're able to effectively 
deliver these fluid boluses and achieve adequate systolic blood pressure. Never, sometimes, most of the time, or always. And I'll, I'll give a minute here for folks to try to answer that question. And I'll try not to bias the answer with my, my guesses here until I see them. Wow. So we're seeing the final answers there. So interesting. Three quarters of the people are saying sometimes, 17% um, most of the time, 7% never. Cool. So it looks like folks think that they are somewhat effective. Uh, some of the time, and I'd love to know more of a percentage on that, but this is just a good, it's a helpful, it's a helpful feedback. Actually, some more answers are still coming in. Let's wait a sec to see how people answer. Okay. All right, so that's about 70% of people. 70% of people are saying they sometimes are able to do it. So clearly not always. In fact, we're getting very, I'd love to know who the always people are. Maybe you can email me and say, tell me how you do it. Um, my email is going to be at the end of the slides here. All right, so let's keep going. Um, thank you for, your, for answering those questions. We'll look at the final results a bit later. Let's look at what the data show um, on how well folks are getting fluids pre-hospital. And a lot of these papers that I'm about to quote for you come out of King County, Washington, Chris Seymour and others um, from King County. And in this paper, they show that in severe sepsis or septic shock patients, remember that the terms are evolving from severe sepsis to septic shock, less than a quarter of sepsis patients, severe sepsis patients, got any pre-hospital fluid. Those who did had better mortality and less organ dysfunction, meaning less renal failure, liver failure, other things. The, of those patients who got any fluids in the pre-hospital environment, the average volume was 500 mils, so one of the bowls, as we mentioned, and the most benefit in terms of mortality was shown in patients who had pre-hospital hypotension, as we would expect. Now, um, next study. You can first look at the graph on the left-hand side. It's basically epidemiology, basically showing that sepsis is growing rapidly as one of the critical illnesses that uh, pre-hospital care providers are encountering, way outpacing now stroke and MI. And remember, this is eight-year-old data. These are eight-year-old data, so it's, it's gotten even more common than we're seeing in this graph. However, um, well, first of all, 40%, probably now 50% of severe sepsis patients uh, who get to the hospital are arriving by EMS. So it's a major condition encountered by and able to be impacted by EMS services. Interestingly, the pre-hospital time on average is long. It's 45 minutes. These are folks that take, that are, that are complex and take a lot of work. And yet, only a third in this study received any IV or fluid in the pre-hospital uh, care. In, in this study, similar to the last one, those who did get fluids got about 300 mils, so, so probably an inadequate amount. And those with septic shock or hypotension, only a few more, about 38%, got fluids at all. So it's a huge swath of patients received no fluids with septic shock in the pre-hospital environment. But remember, those who do have lower mortality. What about in the ED? This is a study that just came out last year out of Northwell Health in, in New York, big kind of multi-hospital system, that showed that earlier fluid initiation in the ED reduced mortality and length of stay. So folks who got their fluids started in less than 30 minutes from presentation had 13% mortality versus those who got them started after three hours with 20%. So this, this just points to and, and reinforces what I shared with you from the EMS studies that the earlier we start, uh, the better patients do. And so EMS is a major opportunity to improve the care of sepsis and septic shock. All right, so now what about the controversy? Haven't we heard that early goal-directed therapy doesn't work? Which to many people means fluids don't work. So let me review with you quickly what early goal-directed therapy actually means and where the term came from. It comes from the, the River study in the early 2000s up in Detroit where he took septic shock patients and challenged them with 500 mil bolts of fluid after placing a central line until their CDP was above 8. 
then added vasopressors to maintain blood pressure, and then measured something called the mixed venous oxygen saturation through a special central venous uh, catheter. Um, a low SCVO2 means the patient has inadequate cardiac output, so it's something you can titrate your therapy to. If their SCVO2 remained low after fluids and vasopressors, they would transfuse blood to get their crit over 30, and then they would add dobutamine if they still needed more improvement in cardiac output. And he showed, uh, and this is a landmark study, that they reduced mortality uh, with early goal-directed therapy from, from 46% to 30 0.5%, a dramatic reduction. Now, this study has been criticized 100 ways, um, including because the baseline mortality was found to be higher in these patients than, than what the, the common baseline was thought to be. But nevertheless, it's added a lot to our knowledge about how to treat septic shock. Subsequently, about 10 years later, three big trials went and reevaluated what Rivers did. These were the PROCESS, PROMISE, and ARISE trials. And I've shown here on the right-hand side a graph of, uh, of a meta-analysis, which basically combines the data from those three trials. And it showed there was no improvement with early old directed therapy, not better or worse. And so people take this data to mean, oh, we shouldn't be giving fluids uh, to septic shock patients. That's not at all the lesson. All the patients enrolled in these trials got two to three liters resuscitation before they were even enrolled, before they were even able to be enrolled in, in the trials. And what we learned is that early goal-directed therapy, or the concept of it, had changed the standard of care in the intervening 10 years, meaning people were more attentive to diagnosing sepsis and resuscitating early. And I love this quote from one of the authors of the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines commenting on these trials. He said, it's almost as if Rivers, Emmanuel Rivers, the author of the first study, had resuscitated these patients and left the building before enrollment began. What he's pointing out is that Adequate and early fluid resuscitation makes a difference in septic shock patients. So what we learned is that there are some interventions that, they, that probably don't help and maybe hurt, like central venous access in all patients. It's an invasive procedure, like central venous oxygen monitoring, T titrating our therapy to CVP. Many people are doubtful that that actually matters anymore, or transfusion routinely to a certain goal. But what we do know helps is that early recognition of sepsis and early reversal of shock with adequate and aggressive, in some cases, fluid management saves lives. And so the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines now recommend that we recognize sepsis quickly by a combination of suspected infection and something called the Q-SOFA criteria. It sounds complex, but it's actually easy. It's just tachypnea, altered mental status, and hypotension. They define their hypotension as a systolic less, less than 100 in order to capture more patients. But if your patient has suspected infection, meaning fever, pneumonia, other things that, UTI, other things that might make you suspect infection, plus two of those findings, they probably have sepsis. And then it's warranted to begin aggressive therapy, particularly if they're hypotensive. Um, so surviving sepsis recommends 30 mils per kilo be given a fluid in the first three hours that we use uh, crystalloids such as saline that we frequently reassess the clinical response of the patient. And I'll go over the markers of that. But basically, simple things, heart rate, blood pressure, entitled CO2, cap refill, that we target a mean arterial pressure of over 65 because we know patients left under a map of 65 have poor outcomes. That we try to normalize lactate. That's not going to be a big pre-hospital uh, marker of improvement, but it's one we're using in the hospital. And that we use norepinephrine for fluid refractory shock. So my questions about surviving sepsis are these. Is 30 mils per kilo in three hours fast enough if the patient has hypotension? Do we have three hours to reverse that systolic of 90? The answer is probably no. And do we have three hours to decide if the patient is fluid refractory or not? Are we going to wait around and say, yeah, that 30 per kilo didn't work, now I need to start the norepinephrine? Or do we want to know that answer quickly? So buried in the um, surviving sepsis guidelines, and I've, I've, I've uh, put a link there for you at the bottom, is this quote, more rapid administration and greater amounts of fluid may be needed in patients with sepsis-induced tissue hypoperfusion, the mouthful. Large amounts of fluid may be administered over a short period of time under close monitoring to evaluate the patient's response. And what I want to propose is that each of us, whether a pre-hospital provider or an ED or an IC provider, can do that close monitoring. We can watch the response of the vitals and know that we're doing the right thing for the patient. So the protocols tell us we should give fluids fast, but we don't get much guidance on how fast or how we're actually supposed to deliver them. Um, 
quick note on pediatrics, which is uh, ultimately my specialty and, and love, is pediatric uh, care and particularly caring for kids with shock. And the 2017 uh, American College of Critical Care Medicine guidelines just came out. They're very similar to the previous guidelines, and I won't dig too deep into the changes. But they still recommend that in children with shock, we rapidly push boluses of 20 mils per kilo with push, which means by syringe, or by a rapid infusion device, by which they probably mean a pressure bag, or a mechanical rapid infuser like EDs may have. It's important to know that kids may need 60 mils per kilo in the first 15 minutes. And you can see on the timeline, zero minutes is the time at which you recognize septic shock. And 15 minutes is the time at which we are to decide if that patient has fluid refractory shock. That's 60 mils per kilo in 15 minutes. And in practice, we know this almost never is achieved. In fact, most studies show that, that busy children's emergency departments um, rarely achieve 60 mils per kilo in the first hour. We're getting better, but it's hard to do. And yet, our goal is restoring perfusion, restoring blood pressure and we have to be able to give those fluids rapidly in order to do it. Well, all the while watching for signs of fluid overload. They're different in kids a little bit. Um, the guidelines recommend that we listen for rowels. It, you know, we don't hear rowels that often in kids. It's not, it, it's a good thing to listen for, but it, it's not our, necessarily our best marker of, of fluid overload. The patomegaly, however, is. It's almost the equivalent of JBD in an adult. A child's liver is very distensible, so if you're giving too much fluid, you may begin to feel the liver edge drop below the rib cage. In children who need fluid resuscitation, they are likely not going to get hepatomegaly with adequate resuscitation. And you can yet use it as a marker of, your, of the adequacy of your resuscitation. A quick note on the change here from the previous um, 2009 guidelines, which is note in the second bo third box, they recommend epinephrine now as our, as our pressure for um, IV or IO uh, delivered epinephrine as our presser rather than dopamine. Many people still have only access to dopamine, and that's fine, but in general, we're trying to move more towards epinephrine. Um, okay, so we know in pediatric septic shock, early fluids reduces mortality, reduces organ dysfunction, again, renal failure, other things, reduces length of stay, and that each hour of persistent shock in a child doubles the mortality. Each time we delay treatment, so each minute matters. Each minute really does matter in reversing shock in a kid. Now, one quick, one quick point on something called the FEAST trial. So we said we'd talk about controversies. I often get asked, what about that trial in Africa that showed that fluid bolts hurt kids? It's known as FEAST. I've linked it there for you at the bottom if you'd like to read it. And it was a trial done um, in children with febrile illness, not necessarily sepsis, but febrile illness and tissue hyperperfusion. Um, which showed that kids who got fluid boluses had more respiratory failure and death than kids who didn't. Uh, it's a fascinating, well-done study. However, it's done in an environment that we are not encountering in this country. Um, the children had a high rate, up to 60% of malaria with anemia. They did not have easy access to oxygen, particularly high-flow nasal cannula oxygen. They didn't have mechanical ventilation, ICUs, or many medicines that we would think of as common in our environment. And so um, many folks question, including the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, whether that's an applicable study to our practice. And it shouldn't dissuade you from being aggressive about a reversing shock in a child with septic shock. It shouldn't make us cautious that we don't overdo it, but it should not dissuade us from providing adequate care. And so all these studies I want to sum up in one concept um, called the slope of resuscitation. I've borrowed this term from a guy named Scott Weingart, who, has the, who runs the EM Crit uh, blog and, and podcast. I've highlighted the link down there if you'd like to listen to it. It's awesome. It's awesome learning. And the concept is that um, standard care is that we don't resuscitate early, and then we continue to do things. We continue to give fluids, medicines, other things for hours and days beyond the initial presentation, which can lead to harm and lead to complications. Whereas if we resuscitate aggressively and early, like the first hour, if you notice the early aggressive care line, and then quickly stop, stop our interventions, de-escalate, bring fluid back off, 
will probably provide much better care for the patient and produce better outcomes. So the emphasis is early recognition, early resuscitation. All right, how to do it? How do we do it? So unfortunately, most of the time, this is what happens. We hold a bag of fluid up and, and stare at it and hope it goes in fast. Even the patient here, you'll notice, is staring at the bag, wondering, is that fluid going to go in me? Now, obviously, he's not in septic shock because he's awakened, awakened looking at the, at the saline. But I put this picture up to emphasize this is probably not the most effective method. So then how do we do it? Well, we hold the saline up even higher when the situation gets more critical. And yet, unfortunately, this doesn't work very well either. That's a really slow and inefficient infusion method, and it's not going to reverse shock quickly. So what other options do we have before us? Well, there's a lot of things. Pressure bags are what most people think of as the fastest infusion method, uh, blowing up a cuff or even a blood pressure cuff around a bag of saline. Number two and three is just squeezing the bag, one hand, two hands, somehow, getting that fluid in as fast as we can. Three, an infusion pump, which is actually always the wrong answer because most infusion pumps run at a rate, a max rate of one liter per hour. And then someone with hypotension and shock, we need to get that fluid in in minutes, not an hour. And then lastly, the big rapid infusers that you see in the trauma room, uh, something like the level one of the Belmont. They're great, uh, but they require large bore IV access. They are complex to set up, and um, it's obviously something that we're not carrying in ambulances. One quick note about uh, IO access, which we should be using in our patients with shock if we're not getting IV access quickly. All these methods are super slow through IOs, and particularly the large rapid infusers may not work at all through intraosseous access. So how can we do it faster? Well, interestingly, it's actually a technique we use in pediatrics, which is called a push-pull syringe technique, where we take a syringe, 10 or 20 ml, hook it to the through-way stopcock, pull fluid from the bag, and infuse to the patient. And this is actually faster than any of the things I mentioned on the previous slide. I know it's not a common technique in pre-hospital care in this country, uh, but interestingly, the right-hand picture you see is an actual picture from a British MERT team, or the British military uh, rescue teams. This is how they're administering blood and fluid in the field. Uh, a 50 mil syringe, three-way stopcock, or they call it a three-way tap, um, sometimes attached to a small warmer, and that's how they're infusing, even through IOs, rapid uh, resuscitation in the field. So let's look at some data, flow rate comparisons. Now, I'm going to, this is a little confusing, but I'll explain it to you. What I have here is flow rates through different gauge IVs with pressure bag, syringe, push-pull technique, or gravity. And if you focus on the 22 gauge, you'll see that 50 mils per minute is about what you get. So it's about 20 minutes to get a liter of fluid in by gravity through a 22. An IO is probably, um, is probably um, about the same speed as that. Pressure bag speeds it up a little bit. And as you get to a bigger IV, you get a little faster. But it's still a liter in 10 to 20 minutes especially if you're not reinflating the pressure bag regularly, which tends to be what people do. They're not fat. They're not quickly reinflating. So the push-pull is a really quick technique and, and doubles the speed over of your gravity or pressure bag. I forgot to ask my question. I'd like to push out a question quickly to everyone. Um, what is your uh, preferred method of fluid delivery and shock in your system? So gravity, squeezing the bag, using a pressure bag, an IV pump or other. Let's see what folks, how folks respond to this. And where would you lump IO administration in this, doctor? Yeah, good question. So I didn't have a lot of data to put on here with IO, but I think AJ, and typically the flow rates are lower around the 22 gauge uh, speed. And there's a lot of different data published. They're all over the map. It depends on what method you use. But the bone marrow tends to be a higher resistance circuit. So it takes pressure to push the fluid in, and gravity and pressure bags can be slower. Uh, it depends on whether it's humeral head or tibia. Some folks think the humeral head is, is much faster, and some data show that it is. Um, um, I use femoral IO access in kids almost exclusively and find that to be faster than tibial. But in my experience, it always takes uh, a lot of pressure behind it to get much volume in. All right, so 
Pleasure bag. Okay, that, that's the winner. Squeeze the bag number two, gravity number three, and it looks like, as I suspected, few people are using other, which is push-pull. Let's go ahead and ask that question while we're at it. Last question. Does anyone ever use the, the documented faster push-pull syringe technique in their care? So in kids, in everyone, or never? So that screen's coming up now. And yeah, and am I ask, let me ask AJ, are the, are the audience able to see our, our survey results? Yes. I don't think so. I'm getting feedback that they're not. So the results on the first survey were that half of people use pressure bags, a quarter of people use the squeeze the bag technique as their preferred fast method, 15% use gravity, and then there's a, a bit of IV pump and a bit of uh, other. And it would be fun for you guys who, who checked other to, uh, to write me and tell me what your preferred method is. Okay. So they, should be, they, should be able, they should be able to see the graph. I'm, I'm okay. asking whether the last survey is up, though, about the push-pull method. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting, some, I'm getting some responses that people are able to see them. Um, okay. So push-pull, using syringes, never is the biggest winner. So it's, a, it's not common. 70% of people do never use that. Interestingly, uh, about a, third, a quarter of folks use it in kids, great, and 5% in everyone. So it'll be fun to talk to you guys and see how effective you find it um, after, the, after the talk. All right. So all to say, this is why I came up with, and our company came up with, the device called LifeFlow which essentially lets us do all this faster and more intuitively. So it's now an FDA-approved device for use in pre-hospital and hospital setting that lets you set up in about one to two minutes and then deliver a rapid and controlled bolus of saline in less than two and a half minutes, somewhere between two and two and a half minutes. So what I'm going to do, um, Sarah, if you'll play, go ahead and play the video just before you start. I will not be able to talk over this, so I'm going to show you a quick demo video of a simulated environment simulated septic shock patient and how our life flow device um, is able to deliver fluid rapidly. Go ahead. Okay, am I back? You're back. Okay. All yeah. right. So basically you saw Sarah um, set the device up in about 60 seconds, and she could have that liter of saline in, through a 22 gauge in about five minutes. So it's a technique that allow, actually allows us to deliver a two bolus, meet the PALS guidelines, and deliver controlled 500 mil boluses to adult patients in a rapid fashion in a way that lets us actually resuscitate, restore blood pressure, restore perfusion, and reassess frequently. One issue with pressure bags and gravity is that we don't have precision in the, in the fluid delivery. We may give too much. We may, we may let it run wide open and forget that we've given a liter. Or it may run over such a long period of time we have no idea whether the fluid made a difference or not. The push-pull technique and then now what we've built on with the life flow is the ability to actually administer a fluid challenge. Give 250 in a minute, 500 in about two minutes, and both have a diagnostic tool, which says that patient, yes, responds. The stroke volume improved, the perfusion got better, the blood pressure came up, the heart rate came down, and then recognize that we need to treat with further fluids and when to stop. And then since it can infuse on its own, we're able to stop and only deliver the bolus that we choose in an efficient and rapid way. Let's look at a quick uh, flow rate comparison here now with the life flow compared to others. You see with the 22 central line, it's about four times as fast as gravity or pressure bag. And again, these pressure bag numbers come from um, simulations where we've actually reinflated the bag. We know in practice a lot of folks don't do that. You pump it up one time and it, 
it, this, the pressure dissipates quickly and it's much slower. Therefore, it's often about as fast as gravity. Um, but we can give that rapid and control bolus in, in much quicker fashion with this technique. Um, we've done a study, a simulation study, kind of fun, where we asked uh, paramedics or nurses to enter a simulated uh, environment with a simulated patient with septic shock. And the instructions were to provide all elements of care, fluids, IV, oxygen, antibiotics, documentation, and they were randomized to two methods, the life flow or the pressure pack. And the scenario is predetermined to require 1,500 mils or three 500 mil boluses to achieve a blood pressure over 90. And what we found is that with a life flow device, the time to infuse the whole 1,500 mils was under eight minutes, and the total scenario time then lasted 20 minutes, well within the typical EMS run. Whereas with a pressure bag, it actually took them 23 minutes um, to get the fluids in, you know, correcting correcting shock much more slowly and 50% and greater time to deal with the entire scenario. So it, it looks like a faster infusion technique can actually make the entire patient care experience more efficient and more effective. Um, all right, on to the last few slides here and then we'll take questions. Um, how do we monitor our response? When, we, when we're looking for volume responsiveness, whether this matters to the patient, what are we looking for? Well, first of all, it's going to be blood pressure. If you're administering fluids for hypotension, we're, we're targeting a systolic over 90 or a MAP over 65. And in kids, remember the calculation is 70 plus two times their age. It works beautifully. I use it all the time. It's my easy gauge of whether this child is hypotensive or not. Has the heart rate come down? Has the respiratory rate and the anti CO2 come down? Is their mental status improving? And is skin perfusion improving? We don't need complex techniques. Uh, mixed venous oxygen, maybe even lactate early on. Ultrasound would be an excellent addition to this, and I, I know ultrasound measures of uh, shock are coming to the pre-hospital space. They're slow to come to the hospital and ED space as it is, but I'm a big fan, and I, and I hope that's something I can teach on in this group in the future. It's also it's a nice additive uh, a test to help us assess volume status, but, but simple clinical markers blood pressure and heart rate and skin perfusion are effective for us in assessing our response to fluids. So while you're on this slide, doctor, give us, give us an example of a six-year-old. Would that be uh, twice their age is 12, so I'm looking for a, a, a systolic BP of 82? Exactly right, AJ. You're good at math. Exactly right. So basically, a 10-year-old gets 90, right? And then everyone above 10 is 90, minimum systolic. A one-year-old is 70, so it's an easy way just to roughly in your mind say, ah, that's hypotension. If, if I double their age, add it to 70, they're less than that, they need resuscitation fast. Does that make sense? And what am I looking for in the end title CO2? Well, I mean, a lot of protocols state tw less than 25 is, is a marker of sepsis. Obviously, if it's under 40, it's probably too, too low. But what I'd say is we're looking for a rise in the end title CO2. This is not just true of sepsis. It's true of other things that produce acidosis, like diabetic ketoacidosis. You can watch the patient's end title go from as low as 5 or 10, and it raises up as you resuscitate and begin to give insulin. So just a, an elevation in the in end title at all is a marker that you are, your fluid challenge is making a difference. You're reducing acidosis, improving tissue perfusion, and reducing the end title CO2. All right, so the question everyone wants to know, can't I hurt someone with fluid? And the answer is, of course you can. Of course you can. And if you'll notice, I don't know how well folks in the, on the web can see the picture, but I've, I've blown up the image of this uh, saline bag. And there's even a warning on the back, special care in renal failure, rapid infusion may be harmful. And that means in renal failure in someone who is essentially a closed box, they are dialysis dependent, they have a fixed intravascular volume, we don't want to give too much fluid. But can that patient become septic? Absolutely. Could they need fluids? Absolutely. So it's more, what is the history of this patient? Do they have a history of heart failure? Do they appear to have volume overload currently, meaning JVD, peripheral edema, rouse in the lungs? Do they have a history of renal failure with those signs of edema? In those patients, it may be unwise to give much fluid, or it may be wise to challenge with a smaller volume, like 250 mils, and see if they've responded, especially if they're hypotensive. But remember, most complications of fluid delivery are seen with large 
cumulative volumes of fluid over the hospital or ICU course. That's where we see harm. ARDS, renal failure, other complications occur well into the hospital, of course, where we have followed that, that low line on the slope of resuscitation and we resuscitate slowly and inadequately early and just keep doing it well into the hospital stay. That's where more of the fluid fears come from. Early on, where we need to reverse shock, we may need to get larger lines of fluid and actually Rivers himself showed that patients who got more fluid early got less later. They required less later because they were resuscitated earlier. Um, and interestingly, I presented to you the paper from Leifman out of Northwell Health. Their second paper that just came out actually demonstrated that patients with shock and hypotension have a greater risk for mechanical ventilation if they were resuscitated later. They developed ARDS not because of fluid administration, but because they were, their shock was not reversed quickly enough. Really interesting data. A quick note on trauma now. We know that people fear fluids and trauma because of the lethal triad of coagulopathy, hypothermia, and acidosis. But in the field, and in many EDs, we may only early on have access to fluid. And so it is certainly right um, when you encounter patients with trauma and hypotension to consider fluid bolses to restore perfusion, especially if they have had injury. Even the military's uh, tactical combat casualty care guidelines on fluid delivery in trauma specify that with patients with head injury, we need to uh, target a higher systolic and may need to deliver fluids. And remember that ATLS, at least in the ninth edition, still recommends fluid as the initial uh, resuscitation strategy. And AJ, I hate to tell you, but on this, on this cover, in the patient who has a traumatic cardiac arrest, that the two fluid bags that are standing and infusing by gravity are probably not going to do the trick. That patient has internal bleeding, external bleeding. He's had a car traumatic cardiac arrest and probably needs more volume than gravity alone uh, will produce. So, um, my conclusions. We need to remember shock is a medical emergency with a high mortality. It, it needs to be treated immediately. And our um, EMS providers can recognize it and treat it quickly and save lives. A good rule of thumb is that a rapid controlled fluid bolus of 500 mils in adults or 20 mils per kilo in kids with frequent reassessment is the best way to begin to approach managing shock. Frequently reassessing, have I made a difference? Is this patient still hypotensive? Do I need to give more fluid? I wouldn't fear them. I wouldn't fear fluid. I wouldn't have hydrophobia, but I would use your clinical skills evaluating vital signs, blood pressure, skin re cap refill, uh, and tidal, and ask yourself, have I, have I made a difference? Do I need to give more? And think carefully about the methods you use. Gravity is probably not adequate in someone. It's not even probably. It's not adequate in someone with hypotension and shock. So think about other methods that you might, that you might use. Um, these slides will be available. I put my email address here. Happy to hear from you. On the website, you'll have access to this whole deck. Um, as well as a brochure on our device, and I'm happy to correspond with you by email later if anyone would like. And so, AJ, we are uh, back, got a little less than 10 minutes, and happy to take any questions that you guys are seeing come across. Well, I'm going to lump a couple in here because people are asking about short transport time and we're close to a hospital, and I think that the answer, um, at least on my end, is that um, you, there is still no excuse for not trying to push some fluids. Am I correct? I would say for sure. And so I, I do hear that a lot, um, that adding a... Um, that adding a... Uh, a fluid bolus in even during a short hospital, a short transport time is important because what we learned from the Seymour data is that, is that patients who got no IV pre-hospital had a higher risk of dying, meaning they didn't get an IV, therefore once they got to the ED it took a while to get the IV in and then start the fluids and all the while shock is increasing. So if you have the opportunity to reverse it, you can make a difference. We reduce mortality, organ dysfunction, length of stay by earlier um, by earlier shock reversal. I don't know what, how, what transport time is too short. I think from the moment the patient is encountered till they are dropped off in the ED is probably rarely less than 20 minutes. If you take, all, take it all into consideration, and in that time you can, do some, you can offer some significant benefit by fluid resuscitation. So tough question, I get it, um, but I still think it's worth well, trying. I think the key is when you say um, ETA, don't tell me that your ETA is from the time the wheels are moving to the hospital. The ETA is from the time you're up in the house 
or in the apartment right. on the fourth floor and can get the patient to the hospital. And that ETA is often 30 to 45 minutes if people look at their trip reports. Um, some other people ask us questions about uh, at what point does the, the fluid challenge drop off and things like Levafed begin because some have Levafed and other things in their protocol. Yep, so exactly right. So back to the protocols that we mentioned, um, most of them are calling for about two liters total resuscitation before starting the Levafed or the norepinephrine. So that's the definition of fluid refractory shock, meaning I gave fluids, it didn't work. How much do, how much do I have to give before it doesn't work? Well, about two liters. Um, that's the, that was about the volume given in the, in the prison, promise process and arise trial. And yet we need an effective speed of delivery of that two liters to know, gosh, this patient really needs some pressors too. Remember, sepsis is a combination of volume depletion and vasodilation. So pressors alone won't work. Fluids alone probably won't work. They often will need both, but we challenge the fluids first. Uh, 500 mil boluses, probably up to two liters. And kids, remember, it's the 60 mil per kilo threshold where we're switching to pressors. And I'm often in practice thinking at 40 mils per kilo, this child's still in shock, I'm preparing my epinephrine drip at that time, even as I give more fluid. And uh, Yosi Friedman asked a good question. That's how much fluid in infant DKA? Okay, DKA is a separate, a whole separate uh, animal. I'll, I'll address it super quick. It's a, a favorite topic and it requires great caution. So we are giving... Remember, children with DKA are at risk of cerebral edema, highly at risk. And so overhydration can cause harm. So we are typically giving 20 mils per kilo uh, to reverse their shock or to start to reverse it, and then only beginning our insulin infusion. Um, in rare cases, we'll give more, but at 20 per kilo is probably where I'd stop initially. Um, if you're the first person to encounter that patient. And I would not ever, ever, ever give an insulin bolus to a child with DKA. You can drop the sugar too quickly and cause cerebral edema. So 20 per kilo is a good starting place. Another, okay, quick, yeah, question. Yep. Another quick question. Um, Normal saline or lactated? Yeah, probably lactated. doesn't matter. Um, I, there's certainly a movement towards balanced solutions. We don't actually have access to a balanced solution in the U.S., like they do in Europe, or like they do closer to in Europe. So I'm fine with either. Um, I, there's certainly advantages to be offered by, LA, by LR. Um, and you do cause a hypochloremic metabolic acidosis with too much saline. So the, the, the jury's out on that still, I believe. AJ, since question. you asked the DKA question, I'm going to answer one more. Someone asked, yeah. um, is, blo is blood glu glucose level a marker of shock outside of a diabetic emergency. For example, in sepsis, is it usually elevated? Yes, in stress it's usually elevated, but in babies it may be, they may become hypoglycemic. The super sick septic patient may also become hypoglycemic. And I, I tend to see the hypoglycemic response occurring a little later, but yes, it certainly can be. Um, uh, any, any concerns with hyperkalemic acidosis in an already acidotic, acidotic uh, patient with uh, boluses sure. of normal saline? Sure, and um, yeah, that, that's one of the big criticisms of using saline. So, yet if that patient is in shock and doesn't have tissue perfusion, you're kind of stuck. That may be the role for albumin or lactated ringers, but but I probably wouldn't. Uh, you know, if that's what you have, it's I still say it's the, it's what you go to. Now, this may be a pediatric question or maybe an all-inclusive question, but uh, what role, if any, does transportation to a, an ECMO-capable uh, peds hospital? make in severe sepsis, and that comes from somebody from Children's in Minnesota. Wow, that's a good question. Um, so if you, I didn't put all this on the slide, but if you, if you follow the ACCM guidelines down the path, you go from fluid refractory to vasopressor refractory shock, which then calls for hydrocortisone, and lastly, the last thing on your, uh, on your list is ECMO as the, as the uh, last-ditch treatment for, for fluid and vasopressor refractory shock. So it's certainly an opportunity. Um, I'm not sure outcomes are great with uh, ECMO for, um, for septic shock, but it can be life-saving. And so I think, you know, the, me the number of children who are actually going to go on to ECMO with septic shock is probably low, but if you have in your, in your 
area of that choice, it's certainly worth considering bringing them to an ECMO-capable center, for sure. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that we have some really amazing um, articles coming out before December and in December about um, ECMO. They're doing ECMO on the streets of Paris right now, and uh, uh, it, it is definitely going to be in the back of everybody's mind in the field about going to an ECMO center when you realize how many patients can be resuscitated. We, we have case examples and people that will be at EMS today that have been resuscitated after six days on ECMO. So um, you're not dead at 20 minutes anymore, and, and you're not dead till we kind of tell you you're dead in the critical care unit. Um, let's go back again. There's a couple questions about life flow, and I'm familiar with the product. Uh, number one, is it pack sterile? Yes. So the the handle part of the gun that you see is is not sterile. It doesn't need to be, but the tubing path, the syringe valve and tubing, which is all custom made, is, of course, all sterile. So the question is, if you had one, can you use it for training to teach your people how to rapidly assemble it and, and kind of play and practice with it? Yes. Okay. The, the, the second question, and I've heard people when I've seen demos of this, wonder how you don't blow a vein when you have like an 18-gauge catheter and you're using uh, a device like yours that's designed to really push. And I, yep. I think that's built into your design. It is. So... Basically, you're, you're essentially doing the same thing that you would with a manual syringe technique. We, we deliver actually quite high pressure and flow when pushing a syringe, a 10 or 20 mil syringe full of fluid through any gauge IV. And is, that, is it possible to in, extravasate or infiltrate in that situation? Sure, it happens, but it doesn't happen that often. And the pressures that are used to infuse intravenous contrast in a CAT scanner are actually way higher than either a manual syringe or our device developed. So there, there's precedent, there's much precedent out there for other um, techniques of, of uh, fluid or contrast delivery that use faster speeds and, and pressures. So in practice, we don't see any increase in, uh, we never have seen a catheter disrupted, but we don't see any increase, increased risk of extravasation using this technique. And it actually forces you to be right next to the patient with a hand on the infusion site, watching it, feeling it. It gives you, the device gives you feedback on changes in resistance. So um, it actually allows you to, uh, actually allows you to quickly sense that there may be a problem with a kink or an infiltration. Um, yeah, and, I just throw out a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just saw one that is stuck in my mind here. Someone said, our protocols permit 30 cc's per kilo to a max of three for adults. We do not stipulate any bolus amounts, just a total. Do you feel these are too aggressive? And I guess my point would be, just like with the surviving sepsis campaign, 30 mils per kilo is a great target, but it might be too aggressive and it might be under aggressive. So if someone is hypotensive, they need that fluid quickly. So if you don't have a, if you don't have a guideline on how fast to give the 500 mils, you probably need one. But sure, a patient may need three liters, not everyone does. If they were, if they're volume response, if they're, if their human, human dynamics are improving, they may be able to go with less than 30 per kilo. So I'd say a blanket one size fits all, especially in the pre-hospital space, is not necessarily right, but not necessarily wrong. You had another question, uh, AJ? Yeah, well, I was scolded once because I gave too much fluid by a good friend who's also a trauma surgeon, and, and it stuck out to me that she said, uh, um, um, fluid, and Kool-Aid do, do not carry uh, red blood cells. And so I know the military has that 90 systolic as a target, and you don't have to really worry about going above 90. If you can get the patient to 90, do you feel that same way? Yeah, and there's even a movement towards hypotensive resuscitation, but I know the evidence is not clean on that, and it's not something that we're recommending for pre-hospital providers. So, yes, but overdoing it potentially has harms for a number of reasons and there's no question about that. However, if the brain is injured and you're not perfusing it, brain cells are going to die. Patients need an adequate blood pressure to maintain perfusion, whether it's by giving fluid initially or blood. Ideally blood, but if all you have access to is fluid, that's the, the best, best place to start. And I was just with Dr. Laporta, who's a colonel and a military surgeon, and he said the same thing that I've heard for many years, and that is that uh, you got to keep your patient from going below 90 because bad things happen when you go below 90. So that that's really your target, am I correct? Absolutely, and 
um, we may have gone a little far overboard in the fear of fluids and trauma. I, I, I don't minimize it at all. I'm not a trauma surgeon. I understand there's a lot of harms, but in the, in, in the early resuscitation, which many of us are involved in, we've got to restore perfusion, and, and 90 or the, or the pediatric target I mentioned to you is a, is a great goal. So, again, the people are asking to, you to review again, how important is it to get that first fluid bolus in pre-hospital? What kind of a role do we really play in, in morbidity and mortality by getting that first fluid bolus in and then following it up on the way in? All I'd point you back to is the data I showed you, and I don't know if, you're, if you'll see my slides come back up here, but first of all, very important. I think pre-hospital providers are in a position to save lives, and I think the earlier the resuscitation starts, uh, here it is, so the earlier resuscitation starts, the better the patient is. So the patients who benefit the most are those with hypotension, and patients who got any fluids lived longer or, li or lived <laughs> at a greater rate and, ha and had less permanent injury than those who didn't. And so I'd say it is crucial. Let's find ways to, to, to make it easier. And, um, and we, we, rely, we rely on our review team for the hot products. You, know, you don't get a hot product unless they really co consecutively among the ten of them agree that it's a hot product. And some of the comments were that um, uh, it was just amazing that you could get 500 milliliters of uh, crystalloid fluid through a 20-gauge catheter in less than 2.5 yeah. minutes. And then the naysayers, and I know there's many out there, say, well, we could do it the same on our own. And I think that our review team said what I've said, and that is put it to the test. Try your device yeah. against any other method that you want, and you feel comfortable that you'll win, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've said it. We've said it on the stage before. Hey, AJ, one or two more little quick ones just to clear up. Someone yeah. asked me 500 mils per kilo for adults, and just to be clear, in adults we're talking about 500 milliliters. Period. In pediatrics, it's per kilo, 20 per kilo. I don't know if many of you may use the hand heavy system in your in your uh, in your ambulances now, and Though the dose for children in Hentevi is pre-calculated of saline at 20 per kilo, so it's right there for you. Um, um, but remember, in adults, we're talking 250 or 500 mils total. In children, uh, we're, we're dosing at 20 per kilo. Well, and a shout out to Antevi because his system is exceptional. But was, how do you also feel about checklists? Because they used to be taboo, but science shows us now in aircraft industry and other things that checklists are absolutely in vogue. If you have a checklist that helps you manage septic shock, use it. We 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 are increasingly using checklists in the ED and in the ICU, and they are extremely valuable. Um, we shouldn't have we shouldn't have too much pride to think that we. Can remember it all. It's all. It's it's worthwhile to be able to refer to a checklist to help us do things that we know save lives. Well, just like the craziness here is another one. The craziness of tourniquets, where we were asked to take them all off units because somebody silly once said that you you know you you cause uh, tissue damage with a tourniquet. Um, the reality is that a lot of crews have taken uh, thermometers off their units. And can you just address how important that temperature is? to be taken in the field more often than they are? Well, it's one of the criteria by which we're diagnosing sepsis, suspected infection, one of which criteria is fever. Um, I would say both for, in, in the management of hypothermia and heat illness, boy, I, I, would, I would recommend that be a piece of equipment that needs to be there. And, and um, so, yeah. Highly yeah, if, if, if you've taken them off, get them back on. And, you know, I've done some work on that, if anybody wants to see that, about comparing different devices. But uh, hospitals take temps. It's one of the things we're taught as EMTs and as paramedics, and somehow it's just fallen off the scale, but it's absolutely a critical vital sign. Um, any other? Yeah, I have a uh, – go ahead. Uh, just cut me off when it's time, but I have a, a memorable case of a football player that collapsed with heat stroke, and the, and the medic uh, – Texted me the picture of the temp, which was 107.7, and 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 thought to give a liter to push a liter of cold saline at that moment, and I think it saved that kid's life. And and maybe he wouldn't have been as uh, quickly uh, resuscitated or even alive if that hadn't happened. So the temp sure drove sure drove the correct care in that case. Uh, we have one here from Matt from Children's Hospital, Wisconsin, that I wanted to get to, and that's about is blood glucose level an indicator marker of shock outside of diabetic emergency, for example, in, in sepsis? Is yeah, I may have mentioned that, yeah. So, so yes, it can be up and down. Uh, babies, I think, tend to have a lot of hypoglycemia. 
And we certainly see hypoglycemia as a stress response in kids with sepsis. And the other one is, do you agree with the work? Somebody said they're spending 27 k a year just in calibrating and doing lactate testing, but I think we've shown from the Orlando studies that in pre-hospital, if they get a, an end tidal CO2 less than 25, that equates to about a 4 in the lactate level. So you don't need fancy stuff. Right. You need end tidal CO2, right? You need end tidal for 100 reasons in, in critical care, and, and one of them is detecting sepsis. So I agree with you that that end tidal can be a good surrogate marker of the acidosis and the lactate. I love it. Um, we could do a whole talk just on end tidal, which I know you've done in your art, in your in your publication. But yes, need it. Um, let's say, how often does a system see a patient in shock, and um, by which category? That's kind of a an overall. I didn't tell you to get that one. Yeah. Okay, well, whoever asked that, please ask the question again. We'll try and get to it. That, but, um, And we'll try to answer some of your questions by email. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, everyone, but we will try to answer them for you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm hoping that this is valuable for folks. Uh, we're going to be following up with lots of articles on it. I think the key is um, septic shock and, and trauma resuscitation. There's been a lot of scare put in people about fluid resuscitation, and if you know what you're doing, you absolutely have to do fluid resuscitation. And and the other key thing is we definitely, through GEMS and you, have, have pushed out and through many other people that we play a definitive role in uh, detection of sepsis, and we play an important role by getting those first boluses in. So it's kind of like stroke. You know, what wasn't in favor now definitely is in favor. So if you want to reiterate on that, I'd appreciate that. Hey, JJ, can you repeat that for me? I'm sorry. Well, it just just in general, the role that we play in pre-hospital in, in, in tackling oh and getting fluid in is, is critical. It, it's not I mean, waiting I think to the get data to the clear. hospital. The data tells yeah, us. I think the data are clear. We can, EMS can make an enormous difference in outcome. Um, in kids and adults, the sepsis and all, all forms of shock. No question about it. This is a medical emergency, just like a stroke, just like an MI. It needs to be treated as such, and you can make a difference. Well, I think that's. I that's know there's lesson. there's a couple hundred people on the phone that are are passionate about this, but we need to wrap up, and we will get back yeah. to your questions via email. I want to thank everybody for participating today, and and uh, particularly to our sponsors here for their support in making this uh, educational opportunity available for you. Uh, Dr. Peel and and, uh, and 410 Medical, we greatly appreciate your support, and uh, we want to thank everybody for attending and remind you that it's going to be archived within 24 hours so you can share it with your colleagues, and I'm kind of begging you to share it with them because this is very important to me um, because I've known people that have been missed in septic shock, and uh, including uh, my pal Muhammad Ali who really was missed and uh, died of septic shock uh, prematurely. So we got to make sure that we... Uh, we, we get on top of this, and we hope to see you back for another webcast soon. So, Dr. Peel, 410 Medical, and all of those people online, uh, thanks for joining us today. We'll sign out. Thank you. Thanks, AJ. Bye-bye. Bye now.